Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Got a couple of thoughts I just want to bring to you. I want to start off by asking you this question. Do you know your why? So to talk about that, just want to start off with this story. Some of you may have even heard it before. The story of grandma's pot roast. You know, we've all heard that story before about the young lady who had the recipe for making the pot roast and she'd get that meat and she would prepare it. And specifically, whenever she did it, she would take it, put it on the cutting board and cut off both ends of the pot roast, making it and all of those things. And it's a delicious pot roast and all of these things, right? And then one day, this young woman decides to ask her mother, you know, mom, I've never really thought about this before, but we've been doing it like this. Why do we cut the ends off of our pot roast whenever we're preparing it? The mom thinks for a second and goes, you know, I don't know. It was your grandmother who did it, so why don't we ask her? So the daughter and the mom, they go to their grandmother and they say, hey, we've been wondering, you know, uh, is it, does it make it more juicy? Does it allow for more of the, uh, you know, spices to get in while it's cooking? You know, what, what's the reason that we cut off both ends of the pot roast whenever we've been following your recipe that's so famous and makes such a great dinner? And, you know, grandma's response to it was um, very, very simple. Well, when I first started making that pot roast, my pot was too small, so I had to cut off the ends of both pot roasts to make it fit in the pot. And so we find ourselves at a laughable truth. Over the years, how much pot roast had actually been wasted following a recipe with a why that was put in place for one specific moment in time that down through the years simply did not hold up anymore? The answer is probably a lot. We probably could have fed a lot more of the family with those two ends of pot roast down through the years. But think about it, it, it it's really true. H how many times have we done this? The why of that was lost over time and what it was replaced with was a why that was possessing a limited understanding and ultimately was much less effective. You know, how many times have we done something for years on end with little or no thought as to why we were doing it or perhaps why we were doing it at all? So what I want to do right now is I want to read out of the book of John chapter 5 and I'm going to go with some pretty lengthy passages. We're going to read the majority of the chapter, but just stay with me, okay? So here we go. John chapter 5 starting at verse 1. And it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another one steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me then said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you're well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. So let's, let's stop here for a moment. We're gonna come back to John chapter five, but, but let's look at what's happened. So you have a man, you have a man who's been laying by a pool of Bethesda for 38 years. So if you look into the study of what actually happened here, it would say that an angel actually came and stirred up these waters and that it was filled with the power from heaven and, and, and one person could go down into there and then they would be healed of whatever infirmity they had, right? So you have one chance, you have one shot. And this guy had been here for 38 years, 38 years. Guys, at the timing of this video, I'm 39. That means that there's one more year that this guy would be laying in that pool from the day that I was born all the way up until now. That's a really, really, really long time. I don't know about you, but I think, you know, after, you know, maybe a decade of, of being disappointed, I'd, I don't know, I'd figure out some way because you gotta, you know, you gotta know the guy's laying there. You gotta know that this is coming every year this happens, right? I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I mean, I'd be having something underneath my blanket to like pitch somebody's way to knock him out of the way. I'm gonna do something 
to get into that water. You know, but for some reason, this guy hadn't done that. And for 38 years, he had laid there. I think it's safe to say that he had fallen into a pattern of why that had lost its effectiveness. So you have Jesus coming to him going, hey, what are you laying here for? Because obviously we know that Jesus knows all things and asks him, what are you doing? And so his response is, well, you know, I've got, I've got this thing and, and I'm invalid and, and you know, we're not making light of his condition, but at the same time, I can imagine Jesus going like, dude, I'd have been knocking people over after, I mean, at least three or four or five and 10 years, you've been here 38, you know? So Jesus cuts through all of this stuff You know, the man's excuses, I don't have anybody to put me in the water, I don't have this, I don't have that. He says, do you wanna be healed? Well, I wanna be healed, but I've got these excuses. Jesus cuts through all of it and says, take up your bed and walk. Instantly heals the guy, stands up, does what Jesus says, and begins to go on his merry way. Yet you see the religious leaders coming and saying, whoa, 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 man, what's going on? You shouldn't even be picking up your bedroll this day, it's the Sabbath, what's going on? Not even, not even considering the fact Hey, isn't that the guy that, and then, you know, you know, can you imagine, hey, isn't that Larry? Yeah, that's, that's Larry by the pool, right? Oh yeah, man, I know that guy, I see him all the time, 38 years, man, we're going strong. Wait, he's walking. None of that's even acknowledged. The simple fact of the matter is they see this guy with his bedroll and want to know why in the world he's picking up a, a, a mattress, essentially, just a little mat on the Sabbath. And he goes, well, the, the guy that healed me told me to do it. Whoa, whoa, stop the presses. Stop, we, we can't have any of this going on. Who told you that? I don't know. So Jesus finds him later and says, look, man, see, you're healed. And, and, and offers him what ultimately healing and miracles and the power of Jesus is all about, that it leads us to live a life like Jesus. He didn't just heal him and say, hey man, I'm, I'm glad I could help you out today. He tells him, go and sin no more. So that was the next part of it. So there was a miracle there, but there was also what Jesus came to bring us. Yes, miracles, yes, healing, all of those things, but ultimately life and life eternal by living for Jesus. So now he knows what his name is and he goes back and says, oh, hey, by the way, I, I ran into that guy again. His name's Jesus and, and, and that's who told me. So the Pharisees go into this furor and go into Jesus and say, how dare you tell this man to pick up his bed and all this stuff on the Sabbath? And Jesus said, my father's been working until now and so I'm gonna work. So don't heal this man. You're right? That, that's basically what they told him. Don't heal this man. Why? Well, because you're doing it on the Sabbath. The original why of that law, and was Jesus advocating civil disobedience? Was Jesus advocating going against the law in the name of what he was doing? Was he, was he circumventing all of that? No, no. The original purpose of God establishing that law was, he said, if you look at the word Sabbath, it means to take a rest. In other words, what God wanted was because he's the one who established it. He worked, he labored, he created the world and then said, there comes a time where you gotta stop and you gotta rest, okay? And you can't keep going, you can't keep this, all this stuff, you've gotta come to a rest. And that was why that was enacted. The word Sabbath means rest, okay? So what did Jesus bring to this man? He healed this man, he brought rest to his infirmed body and then he's going and, and, and you know going about his business. There's not a breaking of that in that respect. They're telling him, why did you do it? They're mad you know, that he did it on the Sabbath. You, you should have waited until tomorrow. Well, Jesus is like, I, I came to do the work of my father. My father's working and so I'm working now. In other words, the work of the father is what Jesus was doing. There was not labor there. And that's ultimately what it goes back to. The purpose of a Sabbath is to come away from laboring, working to make a living, all of those things. That's what God is saying whenever he enacted, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Just as I rested, you have to take a time of rest. And so what did Jesus do there? Jesus wasn't working to earn a living. He wasn't working, he wasn't, he, he, he was literally going about the Father's business, which was bringing life and bringing healing to people. Yet the Pharisees wanted to come against him because of their interpretation of what they saw. Their why, their reasoning for Jesus had lost its power due to poor understanding over time and a lack of effectiveness. So let's look at that. The religious leaders why were placed the original meaning with a limited understanding of the scripture and a much less powerful ministry of Christ's love because they viewed healing a man in the power and love of Christ as a job, plain and simple, not an outflow or an extension of whose they were supposed to be. And many people look to the scripture verses about the Pharisees and Jesus challenged them many times. Why? Because he knew the condition of their heart. Many of the Pharisees that we see in scripture, they were no longer operating in the love of Christ. They were operating out of a sense of obligation. This was a job to them. 
following the rules and the tenets and all of that had become a law. It was no longer out of love. It was no longer out of an outflow to see their fellow man reached with the love of Jesus. It had become a job to them. No wonder they saw what Jesus did as labor and not a working of love. So today I wanna ask you, what is your why? If you've reached a point where things that you do seem routine or stagnant, it might be time for you to review your why. The Pharisees' view of scripture had become so about rules and regulations and tradition to achieve eternal life, they didn't even recognize the savior of the world who gives eternal life, staring them in the face. Their why didn't match the original intent. If you look back, in the scripture verse there, let's jump down. I said we go back. So in John chapter 5, verse 39, let me read that to you real quick. It says, Jesus talking to those Pharisees, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. In other words, look, the ultimate why of salvation and following the Lord is to be in fellowship and spend eternity with him. However, the why of their searching and presenting of scripture had become about receiving glory from those who they led, all right, which leads us to does your why hold up? Does our why, let's say it together, me, does my why hold up? Does our why hold up? Over time, things can change. Our motives, our methods, our ministries, our matches in life, whatever that is, whether it's a job, a relationship, when they do, it's time for us to review our why. Once you've actually been honest with yourself and you've determined what your why is, you also need to determine if it holds up to God's purposes and plans for your life. So let's go back to John 5 again. We're gonna read verses 33 through 38, right? Starting in verse 33, he says, you sent John and he has borne witness to the truth. Now that's Jesus talking about John the Baptist. He said, you sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Now let's look at that. John the Baptist had a ministry that was on fire just before Jesus' ministry came to prominence. If you look in the Gospels, now this is the same John we're talking about that went out and he was preaching in camel skins and everything and he was telling repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John had disciples, he had followers and his ministry was blowing up, right? But ultimately John's why for what he was doing was to point people to and prepare the way for Jesus. Some people followed John's ministry, but they wouldn't follow or believe the very savior that he was preaching about. Think about it, these are people who followed John's teaching. There were people that became John's disciples. John's ministry again was on fire, yet his entire message was, I'm the one in the wilderness crying, prepare the way for the Lord. John's entire message was making way for Jesus to come. I wanna read an interesting passage of scripture to you going back a few chapters in John chapter three. And what it says there is, uh, this is whenever Jesus' ministry was coming to prominence. We're gonna go John chapter three, starting at verse 23, all right? And it says, John was baptizing at Anon near Salem because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and, and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. In verse 30, many of you have probably heard this before, he must increase but I must decrease. This was John the Baptist who enacted this verse of scripture that many of us know. What was going on here? 
Jesus was beginning to come to prominence and John's ministry was beginning to decrease. Why? Because the very one that John had talked about was here. The one that John had been preparing everybody for was now here. And essentially what was happening was by him saying, I must decrease and he must increase. You guys, look, I prepared the way. Now he's here. So you need to listen to what he's saying. You don't need to run to me anymore. The one that I was talking about is now the one who's here. But yet John's disciples were in essence coming to him. Rabbi, look, 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 man, we've been following you. We are like supporters of your ministry, man. Let's take it to today. Man, we follow you on Instagram. We follow your Facebook, man. We're all about you. We've subscribed to your newsletter. We believe you. We support you. And this guy, man, like like everybody, like he's getting more likes on Facebook and Instagram, man. Like like his post, dude. I'm telling you, man. Two months ago, when you made a post about Jesus, dude, that thing went viral in an hour. Now we can't even get you twenty thousand likes, man. Like like what's going on? Jesus is making posts, and dude, they're blowing up. I like to put it in today's language, right? What Jesus was doing was beginning to come to prominence. Yet the very thing that John's disciples were following him for was coming to pass and they didn't recognize it. And John had to put them in essence in their place and let them know, this is the one that I was bearing witness about. The why of why you're following me is no longer holding up. You should change your why right now because the very one that I've talked about is now here. Your why that you've been following and ministering and serving, it needs to change. It needs to change to following and adhering to what Jesus has said. So some people still followed the Pharisees' teachings, which were based in Scripture, right? But still wouldn't follow Jesus. Why did they follow John or the Pharisees then? Well, maybe John's followers thought his ministry was the same as the Pharisees, but John's delivery was cooler than or or more relevant. You know, maybe they saw a way to receive honor or prestige amongst one another. Yet when it came time to walk out the message they were supposed to believe, they wouldn't believe it. And in this way, they received nothing in the end. And in the light of Christ, their wise no longer held up. So as we're bringing this time to a close, let's just look at a few closing thoughts. The ultimate why for our existence is to be in loving fellowship with the Father. Hear that again. The ultimate why for our very existence is to be in loving fellowship with the Father. Guys, everything, everything should be an outflow of that, that why. And the more that we feel His love, the more that we experience His love, the more that we should want to share it, the more that we should want to have it grow in our lives and be a part of things that bring people closer to Him and, and so on and so on. Even in the context of ministry, over time, they, they cease to really support and hold up to that main thing. Many times this happens when we cease to bring these things before the Lord. You know, in Scripture, King David asked God, he said, search me, know me, try the motives of my heart and see if there's any wicked way within me and lead me in your way everlasting. Why? Because he wanted to reveal if there were things that needed to change. You know, often we find something that's working and we cease to bring it before the Lord for his blessing and his guidance. And we can still be doing that very thing long after it has ceased to be effective just because our why for it has become, well, that's the way I've always done it. You know, to bring something back up that Pastor Quentin said a couple of weeks ago, Guys, we are going to get through this. We are going to get through this, absolutely. By the grace of God and by His power, we're gonna get through this. And you know, um, uh, I said early on at the beginning of this message that you know we can find ourselves stuck in routine and mundane and that whole deal. Well, you know, in the circumstances that we find ourselves, we know the why for the routine and the mundane that we are. But you know what? For the moment, that why is still holding up. You know, often we find something that is working and we cease to bring it before God for His blessing and guidance. And we can still be doing that very thing long after it has ceased to be effective just because our why for it has been, because that's the way I've always done it. We need to continually find ourselves like King David, bringing what we do before the Lord to search it, our jobs, our relationships, the things we find ourselves in. Why? Because we need to always be in this shifting thing that never stays the same? No, but because we realize that the only thing in this life that doesn't change is our God, His constancy, and His love for us. Yet the Word says His mercies are new every morning. So we realize that as we walk and as we go with Him, we need to continue to be like David. Lord, search my motives, search my heart. Make sure, God, that I am staying before you and my heart and my why is staying pure before you. So the important thing in all of this is to stay in touch with His guidance. 
This is how we're going to know what things need to change in our lives and what things need to stay the same. You know, the Word of God promised that He would send the Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth and showing people the way, the truth, and the life is why we do what we do. Let's close this time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that it is the way, it is the truth, it is the life. You, God, within us. You, God, in and through us. You are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. And God, I can think of no greater why to live for you than that. Jesus, let us continue to stay before you, God, as we find ourselves in this time, Lord, where everything is being broken down, God, where we are looking, God, to just find some sense of normalcy, God. I thank you that you continue to bring us peace. And Lord, when our lives continue to uh, move on, and Lord, as they return to what we might define as normal, God, let us continue to bring those things before you. And God, say, I want the why of, God, of why I've done this to be for you. Lord, that everything we say and everything we do, God, our family, our friends, our relationships, God, that it would all live in the why, God, of bringing glory and honor to your name. We thank you, Jesus, and we thank you for the life that you've given us. Let us continue to walk in that life. And again, it's in that name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks again so much for joining us today. God bless.